Buckle up, mes amis. We're going on a cinematic journey. We've reviewed every R-series camera that Canon has released, most recently the R3. But no mirrorless hybrid camera has ever impressed me the way the R5C has. And we used the R5C to shoot the short performance film that you just watched. And in this video, I'm going to walk you through our experience of using this camera in a professional context. And we'll cover all the things that really surprised me and some of the pitfalls that you will have to contend with. And we're going to take you through the whole video process and discuss our experience with the camera from prep to post. Let's go. Okay, let's talk pre-production. Now, to give you context for this project, we had about one week to prep this job, and the Canon R5C didn't show up until the middle of the afternoon of the day before our shoot, leaving my colleague Julian and I about two hours to figure out how we were going to rig this camera. Now, this camera is a pre-production model, and as such, no cage exists for it yet, and that meant I had to MacGyver a cheese plate system to mount accessories like a monitor and wireless transmission. Now, I only mention this because I don't want you to look at my rig and go, you're an idiot. It is possible that we could have engineered a much better solution, but we had two hours and whatever gack I have in this bin. So this is where we uncovered our first bump in the road. Beyond the fact that the rig is somewhat unwieldy, we couldn't power the camera through V-mount batteries. Now the reason for this is that in order to down convert the PTAP voltage to Canon 9 volt, you need something like an Anton Bauer transformer. Going through USB is possible, but only if it's USB-C. USB-A delivers up to five volts and that is not even enough to turn the camera on. The good news is that a USB-C battery brick will do the job. Now we brought one along in the instance that we ran out of LPE6s, but that never happened. And we still use the V-mount to power our monitor and our transmitter. Originally, I had intended to swap from fluid head to gimbal throughout the shoot, but the Franken rig proved converting over would be a complete time suck. Additionally, RF lenses are quite big and heavy, and without counterweights, it pushed the camera well into the back bleachers where the EVF cup would then hit the gimbal. The EVF cup is removable, but requires a very specific size of eyeglass screw, which I did not have. So in the end, I just did one gimbal shot for the entire film. My advice for gimbal users in respect to this camera is that it'll be much easier to use on larger gimbals like the Crane 3, the DJI R2, or simply just make sure that your counterbalance game is hella tight. The final step in our prep was to test out all the key functions of the camera and get it set up to my liking. My first test was going through the codecs and making sure that they would all play nice on my computer. To my astonishment, they all played back on my 2019 MacBook Pro without proxies, even the 8K RAW. And I have to admit, I didn't expect that. And one of the greatest things about this camera is the introduction of the Canon XF AVC codec, which is available in both intra and long gop. And we also had ample CF Express cards and a very specific shot list. So I opted just to shoot intra frame, saving me some transcoding time. I could have opted to shoot proxies on a separate SD card, which in retrospect, 
would have been a good idea. It's a very important feature and you should use it. We also tested autofocus, which as predicted worked out outstandingly well. I would say Canon is an industry leader in autofocus at the moment, which was great news because I couldn't afford a focus puller for this job. The autofocus, however, is not without its Achilles heel, which we will discuss a bit later in the production segment. Now, the final act was to familiarize myself with the design and functions of the camera. Now, to be honest, I kind of expected a weird Franken camera experience like, What's the deal with the two menu buttons? But stay with me here, kids, because holy mother of God, this camera is impeccably designed. It is as close as you can get to two separate cameras in one. Now, if you shoot Canon stills, then the layout will be familiar to you. And if you shoot video with cameras like the C70, then the layout will also be familiar. Canon accomplishes this by having a wall between the two functions. The text next to the buttons indicates a video feature, and the text inside the button indicates a photo feature. You can no longer shoot video in stills mode and vice versa. They are two wholly independent functions. Now, if you don't like the layout, you can remap almost all of it, but I felt absolutely no need to. It made all beautiful, perfect sense. Secondly, the addition of the C70-like exposure tools in the video mode made me salivate like a dog running in a field of meat. So many options, so glorious. Speaking of C70, Going into this, I was certain that I would hold the position that it can't possibly replace the C70 because of things like ND and buttons. But say for internal ND, which is actually a big deal, there was no reduction in speed of using the touchscreen over the C70's function buttons. The C70 is still a super amazing camera and for dock shooters, I still think it's a much better choice. But for narrative or commercial filmmakers, the R5C feels like a much better choice since the pace of shoots allow for time to swap out filters, etc. Speaking of filters, we didn't have the budget for 4x5.6 filters, so I foolishly opted for screw-on filters. Don't do this. I do not recommend. Why? Well, for one, I think I dropped a filter about five times that day. None of them broke, but still. Furthermore, and more importantly, I created a barrel of filters that ended up vignetting on wider lenses. 4x5 filters would not have done this. In a cinematic and professional context, filters are very important. I almost always use a polarizer, ND, black pearl mist, and even some glass effects. This all helps us to control the look, so the filter strategy needs to play into how you use your camera. This is also why I say use a larger gimbal, because chances are you're going to need to use a matte box for anything beyond a single variable ND filter, and you might still get vignetting depending on your focal length. Okay, so let's move on to production day. As amazing as this camera is, it's important to note here that the camera doesn't make the image. If you like anything that you saw in this film, it has more to do with the incredible talent in front of the camera, the production design team, hair and makeup, styling, my grip and electric crew, and the location. The camera really just works to elevate it vis-a-vis -vis its resolution and color science. And I'm pretty sure that I could have made it look like this with any modern camera. Where this camera pulls ahead is in its options. As with all Canon cameras, C-Log3 has a beautiful highlight roll-off and a great dynamic range. I would say some of the best in the industry. And in my observations, the closest color and gamma profile to an Ari Alexa that I've ever seen. But that's not what I want to talk about. Because I scrapped my gimbal plans, I had to let the 8K RAW do some of the work for me. And I've always scoffed at 8K as being unnecessary, a bit of a contest between brands to show off how far they can um, urinate. Now, I'm staking my claim here today though, that I was wrong. 8K is actually remarkably useful. It gives me so much latitude to move or resize the image. And with a bit of noise reduction applied, makes a very nice clean image. Now, of course, the downside to AK is just one of cost. You can get it in two flavors of raw, both standard and light. But we opted for standard because we had the card space. The files end up being just a bit bigger than twice the size of XAVC IntraFrame. And so you have to build this into your budget, not just in CF Express Media, but also your drives, backup drives, plus proxies, and well, things build up pretty quickly. Now this project alone without proxies came in at 753 gigabytes, all for about one minute in a 30 second film where 70% of the footage was acquired in 4K. Speaking of 4K, unlike the R5, which has two 4K modes, this one only has one, and it's automatically oversampled to produce a gorgeous, detailed 4K. Now, before we move on, I did want to show a bit of a negative, 
and one that might just be simply a factor of this camera being a pre-production model. I shot a few things in 4K 120p. I was overall very happy with the results. However, if you look closely, there is a strange lateral pattern to the noise. Perhaps this is from line skipping on the sensor or really, I have no idea. Fortunately, this can mostly be teased out with noise reduction and contrast, but it definitely affects the organic nature of the image compared to one with a random noise pattern. Perhaps this will be addressed in a future firmware update. Okay, so let's take a brief moment to talk about my favorite subject, usability. Listen, I shit on mirrorless cameras a lot when used in a professional context because they are by design a nightmare to use. Basic functions are often hidden inside inception style menus, batteries die far too quickly, the cameras overheat, and everything is fiddly. The R5C is the very first hybrid mirrorless camera that none of that applies. The camera never overheats, like never, the batteries lasted suitably long where we never needed an external power source. And best of all, all the important functions were at the tip of my fingers and didn't slow me down one bit. Though the micro HDMI is probably the single greatest letdown on this camera. Canon, you got 99.9% .9 of the way there and then micro HDMI, so close. Another great save on the day was the new dual-based ISO. It changes based on your picture profile, but in C-Log3, it's 800 and 3200. Due to the speed of our production and our lighting options, the second base ISO pulled its weight. Additionally, while you can hard select between the two, the auto feature allows you to toggle to any ISO and it will just simply auto select the base. A nice time saver. As mentioned previously, the autofocus was such a valuable tool on this shoot due to not having a first AC or cinema lenses. In 80% of the situations, the autofocus worked outrageously well. Where it struggled was in any super low contrast environment due to the haze or any backlit scenes. In these situations, I just simply had to switch to manual focus. Even still, the tracking autofocus was spot on and beautifully responsive when it worked. Lastly, and this is my most favorite thing, this is the very thing that makes this a cinema camera. There is no IBIS. The Sony Venice is an $80,000 cinema camera with no IBIS. Same for any RE camera or RED camera. Why? Because the look of handheld from any camera with very little rolling shutter is the closest you will ever get to feeling like you're shooting with film. That means with the R5C, I can handhold it in a way that feels genuinely cinematic and filmic. The sensor readout on the R5C is lightning fast. And let's not forget, this is also a 45 megapixel photo camera. For those used to smaller bodies, no question, this will take some adjustment in respect to the bulkier size due to the fan. However, it feels very similar to a GFX 50 or an S1H not excessively bulky. I think if I was primarily a photographer, it wouldn't really pose too much of a problem for me. The fan in no way got in the way of a secure EVF eye fit. Due to this being a pre-production camera, I did not have access to the raw photo files, so I had to shoot JPEG, but the color is beautiful and the JPEGs were remarkably robust. Due to the highlights coming in, I intentionally underexposed to protect for that and all the info was there. If you're doing something like photojournalism, then you can be rest assured that you're handing over a suitably robust JPEG. All in all, photography approved. On to post. As I mentioned, I chose somewhat foolishly not to send proxies to an SD card. This means that I had to work with the native codec since my post-production timeline or my hard drive size didn't really support a transcode process. Now, in Premiere CC, there was no doubt some stalling and stuttering of even the XF AVC intra files, but not so terrible that I couldn't edit. Proxying would have made this super fast, but I was also okay with the slight inconvenience. I don't edit in DaVinci Resolve, but I did test the footage in Resolve and the playback was super smooth, even in 8K RAW, leading me to think I should probably learn to edit in Resolve. But once again, note that I have a 2019 MacBook Pro and those with new M1 Macs or new PC laptops or desktops should have really no foreseeable issues working with proxies in Premiere. Though I can't speak for experiences, of course, with Avid or Final Cut. Now, when it comes to grading XF AVC, that responds quite quickly to changes, whereas the RAW does seem to chew up a bit of system memory and is a tiny bit sluggish. This is generally fine for online and again, may not be an issue on M1 Macs or PCs. Like all C-Log3 files from other Canon cameras though, the R5C files are a bit weaker in the shadows. 
So that means if you've underexposed, then you'll likely introduce some significant macro blocking noise, which can be teased out with noise reduction at the cost of some image sharpness. Now this can be refined greatly with a talented colorist, so it's not something I worry too much about in a professional context, but it is something of concern for independent video producers with smaller budgets and less resources. And that's it. There are certainly a lot more I can say about this camera, but these were the points that I felt most valuable to you, the potential user of this camera. There are many other great reviews online that you should watch for everything which I may have omitted. But as always, if you like what I'm doing over here and you wanna see more videos like this, then please, kindly subscribe to this channel and please comment in the comment section down below because it feeds the hungry algorithm monster. Feed the beast people, feed the beast. Thank you again to Canon for lending us the camera, my new colleague Julian for helping out and my whole crew for the short film. For me, for now, I'm out, peace.